It's wonderful to be here at Beersheba. Uh, Beersheba P. Cain in 1833 was riding a horse up the side of the mountain here and found a medicinal spring. And uh, she got off and said, tastes like medicine to me, and that's what started this place. This has been a great water hole for all of us. The vitamins of wilderness have been here in abundance, and it's attracted to everybody from Armfield to us. And uh, it's been a real pleasure to be out here today with uh, uh, the flowers and with uh, friends who know the flowers. I don't consider myself a botanist. I just enjoy going along, and uh, I do what comes natural. I'm the state naturalist. Um, most of our people are employed by the Conservation Environment Department are stationed uh, like our, our folks here tonight. And we're glad to have you all here who do the wonderful work of keeping these places together. Otherwise, uh, folks have been known to love them to death and uh, take a little piece home with them uh, until finally there's not much left. So it's a real dedicated love and labor of love that our state parks people, our naturalists, interpreters, and others work. Um, when I came back with the department after having started with them uh, almost 40 years ago, the, they said, what you want to do? I said, well, you got somebody or else, why don't I just be the one that goes statewide and does what comes natural? And so that's what I've been doing. And I, over the years, I've been very fortunate. I started in, uh, in Nashville in 64. I attended a conference that year in Wisconsin. I met a Latvian professor from the University of Tennessee at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And he said, what are you doing to save Savage Golf and May Pray? And I thought, oh, I hadn't heard of either one of them yet. But I got back here and I flew over the Savage Golf um, and from the air, virgin timber doesn't look very sexy. But uh, I got back down here and walked and I, as we did today and I had uh, eight others today that went down. How many? Raise your hands. Who went and are survivors of going down to Savage <laughs> Creek and back again. And we walked through these big trees and those big trees are still there. And that's a wonderful feeling. The man who owned the trees was Mr. Sam Werner, whose family had kept them all these years and hadn't cut them. And uh, he's, he loves to play with jeeps and all those things like that. And money didn't mean much to him, but he said, you know, the taxes are eating me up. If you want to save me, better hurry. But I'd like to see those trees reseed the whole plateau. So that's how we got started in the 60s. We led many groups down here. The first started was the Middle Tennessee Conservancy uh, in Nashville, whose purpose was to save Radnor Lake and Savage Gulf. And they kept on until they got the Savage Gulf Preservation League. And they took up this specific project and they wrote every legislator. And when the bill came up, the legislature that went through like a grease pig. And so then we elected a younger governor who was 42 years old, and uh, he was having a hard time from the opposing political party. And we said, don't you want to stretch your legs? And he says, yeah, I want to get out of town for a weekend. So he came up and rode horseback and hiked through the Savage. And afterwards he said, this is so pretty. He was from Memphis, like I was. And flatland furners like us down there with webbed feet. We don't see much mountain country like this. So he said, just buy it. So we went to work. The uh, Secretary of the Interior and the Land and Water Conservation Fund money and all that began to uh, look favorable in the state. Also uh, organized a uh, land conservation effort through the Conservation Department. So Savage Gulf is a present we gave ourselves. We first purchased 50, uh, let's see, the, for $50 an acre, the stone door out here. And uh, Dennis Brown, who was the manager and his wife of the Bersheba Hotel, had gotten the owner to donate the property and agreed to do that, but the man dropped dead that afternoon before he could dictate it to the secretary. So Dennis almost got it set aside then. But after we bought the top, we got uh, money from Governor Clement, and Governor Clement said, you know, ta uh, tourists are easier to pick than a bale of cotton, and they're worth more. And so we were able to get a $5 million bond issue passed, which enabled us to buy a stone door, stone fort at Manchester, Big Bone Cave, uh, Rock Island State Park, Roan Mountain in East Tennessee, and about uh, almost a dozen parks. So we really got a bargain for our money. Right now, uh, Governor Bradison uh, has had to take our acquisition money because he was $17 million short. He got a, he got, uh, when he came into office, there were some outstanding bills, too many shoemakers, I think. And uh, he had to take and divert the money. But I hear there's some sympathy for maybe a, a bond issue, we don't know, that might be able to, to buy land while land can be bought. Because as you all know, it's now or never. So I'm going to go ahead with our slides. And uh, 
uh, look at some of these pictures, if we can have the lights down, and uh, we'll take a look, see, this is the new building here. I'm grateful to Cal Turner for uh, what he's done and con uh, contributing to this. Uh, this mountain country up here, this, if ever there was a Cumberland Mountain Wonderland, we're sitting atop it right up here. No wonder John Armfield and so many others have loved it. In the spring of the year, the mountain laurel are awful pretty. And I can't see to focus this, so if it doesn't do right, please readjust. But uh, the mountain laurel from the top of the Swanee Domain uh, to the whole South Cumberland area around here. This is uh, Scott Davis, the uh, leader of the Tennessee Nature Conservancy chapter. They have a great dream for this whole South Cumberland area that goes all the way into Alabama of trying to reconstitute uh, the Carter Mountain property. Mr. Carter put together 80,000 acres, which uh, after his death was sort of split up among his heirs, but a lot of it's still there. It extends all the way up here to Mont Eagle and to our area. They also have a North Cumberland's initiative and they have purchased about 5,000 acres out here of uh, area overlooking the, the, the bluff line, which is the sort of thing that cliff tops developers and Fairfield Blade developers really love. So we're fortunate that we have that support. And then there's another, I just want to start by saying the uh, South Cumberland Land Trust had uh, Dr. E.O. Wilson from Harvard, the great ecologist, come down and uh, they took him out to a beauty spot on the Suwannee Domain, which is 10,000 acres, the largest uh, campus, I believe, of any any university in the world. And Wilson, instead of them giving him an honorary for coming to speak to them, he gave them $1,500 and said, here's the money for the first acre. I challenge you to get the rest of it. So they now have half the money to buy the rest of Shake Rag Hollow. They've raised already $100,000 and they're going after it. And uh, that's the kind of wonderful enthusiasm that Tennessee's volunteer spirit has. This, um, this is Shake Rag Hollow. It's a little beauty spot at San Andrews, and if you're going back to the west, just go through the Swanee Gates and turn off and pull up in the side of the road and park, and you'll see this little trail leading down into the woods. Now, the South Cumberland Land Trust has 1,100 acres that they are purchasing as a, as a complete block. One of my friends has a, has a house out here. He was sitting in his hot tub the other night and a mountain lion squalled. He said, the water sure got chilly after that. <laughs> and uh, he's my old buddy, Sanford McGee, who's one of our best naturalists, and now he's doing good work. So this country inspires people to do what they can. And when we had the Tennessee Federation of Garden Clubs meeting up here 25 years ago, we dedicated the Suwannee Natural Bridge. But uh, the Suwannee Natural Bridge is a beauty spot which was donated by the University of the South to the people of Tennessee. And just about 100 yards beyond there is the northern range of the, of the tropical filmy fern, Trichomanes boschianum. And uh, the, all that's there is about six feet wide and about three feet thick. In fact, it's not even continuous. That's, a, that's just uh, the dimensions of the little rock strata in which it's found. So this is an amazing little, little uh, ferny friend that's survived all these years. And there may be other places in Tennessee and it's found in Winston County, Alabama. But plants are like, you know, they got to bloom where they're planted and they can't jump up and run, and they can't hide from climate change. And so we have a special obligation to not let these places and these species slip away from us. And when you look back in the rocks, the rock story here uh, in the Cumberlands, you realize that the, uh, the ferns that we have today uh, began two or three hundred million years ago in the Carboniferous period. And the, and the Whitwell Shale Formation, and the Red Dog Coal Deposits, which they have baked in the years past, uh, can be broken open and reveal these uh, wonderful fern prints. And they're little changed. They were some of God's best ideas then, and they still are. And they, they deserve our protection. And so, as Thoreau said, if ferns, uh, nothing could be easier to ascertain the character of the enthusiasm and the species, but if ferns should be another sacred scripture and revelation to you, that's not so easy. And that's what we've got to get across to the children of tomorrow. But these are part of our spiritual heritage. And we have the Carter Cave, which is donated actually by Harry Lee Carter and his wife. It's 150 acres. It's a small area, but most of it is tucked away underground. Buggy Top Cave, it has this impressive cave mouth. There are lots of little uh, prairie species that are clinging to the rock faces out there. They're not only plants, but they're salamanders, like the Tennessee blind cave salamander, blind cave uh, fish, copepods, and other creatures which can't live otherwise. And out at the mouth of the cave, a wonderful display of our 
purple cone flower. So this is the kind of stuff that that's, makes up a part of the Cumberlands here. And many years ago, uh, when I first started in the 60s, I, I was driving down the road and something pretty and red caught my uh, eye and it was paintbrush. And it was right down here uh, going around the bend between, Alt uh, I guess, Altamont and uh, going, let's see, no, it's between here and Altamont. It was on the Fire Skull Creek there, right on the road bank. And then as we went around today to the Savage Gulf Ranger Station and went uh, north just about a quarter mile, there was another little prairie uh, collection there. And uh, those of us who've been to May Prairie over here, and I think we went there last time, uh, know the value of these prairie plants. They're very hardy, they're very tough, they're very resilient. They come back after a uh, long oppression. But some of these things we saw today, and we see them here, like the Lytris uh, spicata on the side, the blazing stars on the side of the bluff. And this is out here at Stone Door, and Stone Door um, has no trees. And so these little prairie plants have no competition. So on these ball rocks, we see a lot of these little hardy survivors that are still coming back year after year. And uh, under the power line at uh, Boster Falls, and out there today under the gas pipeline there off of Highway Beyond Altamont, we saw a lot of these beautiful little, little uh, these little candy candy wands. When you pull them out by the roots, they have an incredible licorice candy smell uh, in the roots. My friend Grady York, who's 87, just taught me that last week, and it was nice to learn. And then, of course, one of the uh, testiest little plants up here in the mountains is, is Shrankia, the little sensitive briar. And John Muir walked through the Cumberlands in 1867, on September 23rd. He said, my path today led me across the Emory, a branch of the Clinch. I entered a grand rock dwelling, the first mountain stream I ever beheld. And he noticed that the sensitive briar along the paths leading to the schoolhouses didn't do anything. He figured the schoolhouse boys had teased it beyond its willingness <laughs> to respond. And so this is one of those crazy little plants when you, when you wiggle it, it just closes up in shyness and embarrassment, like the mimosas that close up at night. And the wonderful, amazing thing about how the antiquity of these plants is, and I'm no botanist, but when you think about, I've seen so many acacias in Brazil, and they are also in Africa, and when the continents, the continental plates, the tectonic plates were close together, it's how long ago the, these wonderful legumes and mimosas and these plants evolved, and they're still, they're still there, and they're plants in, in China, which are very much like the ones in Savage Gulf. I know because I spent a wonderful afternoon with a Chinese professor who spoke no English and I spoke no Chinese, but we got along in Latin because we had so many common botanical names that he, that he could and I could uh, understand. Like Pycnanthemum, this uh, wonderful snow on the mountain to the mountain people is a, a really spicy, wonderful aromatic mint and uh, one of the medicinals up here, so is ginseng. And we export in Tennessee 11 million dollars of ginseng, which comes, the best of it, comes out of the soil nutrition of virgin soil from the woods which you haven't messed with. And this virgin nutritional soil, where these trees that we saw today lived and died and, and rotted back and re recycled their nutrients, that's the original nutrients from God's Eden over in Savage Gulf. It's never been diluted, it's still there. And that's what makes the most expensive ginseng, and that's what we pay the highest for. And there are many of these medicinals, like the echinaceas. Uh, I think the German pharmaceuticals have 60 different medicinals made out of echinacea. And we have sort of lagged in that. We're beginning to catch up here. And so medicinal plants, at one time there were over 300 species that were collected in Tennessee. This has been a long tradition. And when John Muir crossed the Cumberlands, just after the Civil War in 1867, he was set upon by a, a band of probably some of Morrell's uh, raiders, some of the worst outlaws who, who would have killed you for anything. When they saw Johnny walking along with his plant press under his arm, they figured he was just a poor herb doctor and too poor to be worth a bullet. And so they let him go. So he went on then to save the Yosemite, to take Teddy Roosevelt camping and, and to set up the Sierra Club. And so Johnny, of all people, loved plants. He took studies at the University of Wisconsin in botany and geology, and then he headed for the University of the Universe. <laughs> and he reminded me of Alexander von Humboldt, who lived about the same time in 1870, who said, let those who were wearied with the clash of warring nations 
turn our attention to the silent world of vegetation and know that this world will continue to teem with new life. And so my cousin found inspiration down at Fiery Gizzard to uh, put out his first batch of Fiery Gizzard rum made out of Tennessee molasses. And uh, this uh, is just off of the park where he happens to be there uh, with Bud Werner's camp. But uh, he's considering making another run of that, and he's also considered making what they used to make there, which is the old-time uh, value-added product made out of Tennessee Waters moonshine. <laughs> um, today, we didn't see any of these wonderful creatures, another one of God's best ideas, but we did see a little copperhead, and the copperhead was friendly, wasn't it? Didn't anybody get nipped? And nobody nipped the copperhead. About uh, 11 Sierra Club hikers went by, before somebody on Peak Mountain said, hello, ain't that a rattlesnake? And Burr Rattlesnake said nothing because the tail was paused underneath and the head was up above. And I'm sorry, I can't see that picture, but I hope you can, I think it's focused. Anyway, uh, Burr Rattlesnake, I stood there with a stick to make sure nobody poked at that snake because I thought if he had that good of manners, we didn't want anybody teaching him worse manners. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the way they are in Savage Gulf, as our neighbors here pointed out. Uh, uh, the, the, it's wonderful to go wandering in the savage and as John Muir said he really didn't like to hike but he liked to, liked to go sauntering he liked to go a la sauntere to the holy land as people had come back in the older days and it's wonderful to go out there you're more in danger not from rattlesnakes but from gravity because the, the earth continually continually calls us all home doesn't it and uh, this lady's sitting out on the end of Peak Mountain just looking down below and it's per near perpendicular as some of our mountain friends can tell you, looking across, and here it truly is perpendicular. And I want to tell you that mountain moonshine and flying don't mix. For some of these boys, we've had to haul carcasses out from the bottom, and that's a long and hard job. Um, so here is a place where the rock strata is, is revealed, and it shows you that 250 to 70 million years ago, the Ozarks, the height of the Rockies, gradually washed away, and the sediment swept to the east to the edge of the Atlantic, which was here. And so the shallow seas that were here laid down beds of ripple marks that we can still plainly see there on Stone Door, and, and fern fossils, and little round pebbles of quartz, some of which are tainted pink with titanium from the Arkansas uh, deep uh, diamond mine district. And so all of this rock story is like Shakespeare said, we can read sermons and stones and books and books and good and everything here at Savage. And there's such beauty. This is like a perpetual art gallery. This is uh, Still Point Falls when the water was flowing. We went down that creek today. Uh, it was mostly uh, asleep, but waiting for the next good uh, thunderstorm, uh, cloud uh, burst, and it would revive again. Now we found out that Savage Gulf is still savage. Some of those rocks are slick and slick and slick. And down you go. This is Grady York and his wife Willa. About 30 years ago, I used to take a lot of people down through the Gulf to make them aware and hope they'd write letters to the governor and to their politicians, and they did. Um, we sometimes taken, <laughs> we started out with almost 100 one time at Savage Falls, and by 5 the next morning we got everybody out. <laughs> but uh, I wouldn't recommend that, to be honest with you. It's a it's true wilderness, and wilderness eats the unwary for breakfast, and the rest of you are stuck in there, and hopefully we'll flush out at some point. Here's my German naturalist friend, Eric who just said there were more species of trees he found in Savage than he had found in the whole continent of Europe after the Ice Ages had obliterated it. Here over his shoulder is a huge chestnut which uh, had been burned out by bear hunters uh, from uh, years past. So imagine, he said, how this must have been at Savage when the big chestnut trees were six to eight to ten feet in diameter. And you had this enormous amount of big trees here that uh, were the main old, uh, producer of, of viable nuts, and nuts which the animals like the passenger pigeons and the buffalo and the elk and the Indians ate. And uh, we're working now through the American Chestnut Foundation, some of my best friends are nuts, and they're breeding a cross, a back cross edition, which they think they'll soon have ready that will be resistant to the blight. So we hope that also a variety can be produced that will grow in more hostile sites. It would be great for some of the strip mines and places like that. But anyway, Savage Gulf is a treasury of trees. Some of the genotypes here are very ancient, and uh, it's important that some of the uh, germplasm of places like Savage Gulf be uh, studied. 
I believe in the Smokies there is an all taxa biological inventory. They have a little newsletter. I'm going to take our staff over there next week to uh, visit the ATBI Center. Uh, they have volunteers who are working to study uh, and to produce an inventory of the Smokies, which we really need to have here. Here's Dr. Quarterman from Vanderbilt, who of all people has been so helpful in studying the interior low plateau. She was a student of E. Lucy Brown, and uh, she uh, has others like Tom uh, Hem uh, Hem Hemley, who was her student. This is Governor Winfield Dunn, the, the 42-year-old governor, first Republican elected in Tennessee in 50 years, and uh, he really uh, supported the natural areas. We got a natural area bill passed, sponsored by a Democrat, Bill Bruce, and a Republican, uh, Victor Ash, and the governor signed it, so that's how we got these places. This big tree is still there. We were down there today. And Alice Jensen, I believe I got a picture of you standing beside it, like Elsie. So, this is uh, one of the big poplars, but only one. The trees there, some of them are still so big, it's difficult to, to tell what they really are, unless you've got binoculars and can look all the way up at the top. Here's Kiku Hoagland, who raised $6 million for the Nature Conservancy one year. Her a prize was to be brought up to see the savage. This place has become such a well-known and worldwide attraction, and we're very grateful to people like her who have helped to save it, because the Nature Conservancy helped to buy land here under Big Creek Gulf. Some of the big short-leaf pine and savage are 300 years old. They were created perhaps by a big fire here that happened that long ago, and now have grown back. And they have somehow withstood, many of them, the pine beetles, because they're more scattered. Uh, you, the secret is the pine beetles can't fly from tree to tree. They have to fly across several acres, and they don't always get them. So some of them here are record size, and uh, we're lucky that we have uh, this great area. Dr. Quarterman and Dr. Robert Crawl came to consider what the effect of pine beetles could be on a virgin forest. And they said, leave it alone. Don't cut anything down. Just let the beetles and the pines do their thing. They always have, and they haven't eliminated each other yet. It seems that the beetles peak every 10 years. Bowwaters thought they could bring in a hybrid pine and cut it in 20 years, but they didn't make it. The beetles got to them before, the, 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 uh, and the drought got to them because they were not very resistant. And the problem is the pines can't produce enough sap to flush the beetles out. So when 30,000 southern pine beetles hit a tree, it's curtains, even if it's a, a southern um, a pine like our own short leaf here. But um, here's what it looks like from the air, from an eagle's eye view. Um, and you can see how close the, the Bowaters pine plantations have come to the Savage. For that reason, we bought a strip here that we walked through today. And we actually walked right out here and went down this declivity down to the bottom of the creek. And it doesn't look like very far, but it's, pre it's, it's pretty <laughs> steep, isn't it? So it's, uh, that adds a factor of 10. So if it was a mile hike, it was more like a 10 mile hike. And uh, that makes a difference. But his, this is what it is, a treasury of trees, beautiful in the fall of the year. You're looking here from about Rattlesnake Point across Peak Mountain. And we were lucky to get Billy Whitson, uh, who owned 3,000 acres in the Lower Gulf. His daughter, Jane, who helped us save Radnor Lake, said, Daddy, if you ever cut those trees, I'll never speak to you again. And he didn't cut them. And so we were almost able to add another uh, aging forest, not a virgin forest, but a wonderful forest to the park. Here you find the black-throated green and blue warblers, the veeries and the brown creepers, which normally nest in Canada, but they stop off here because this is a northern uh, boreal-facing slope which finds what they need. You can find uh, cordyceps and many fungus among us here, and sometimes um, some remarkable wildlife as well, like the little uh, hemlock trees growing amid this nurse log. Uh, with the millipedes. You know, the millipedes secrete cyanide gas, so they've, they've got a, a trick which is like a skunk, you know, a very unique and potent defense mechanism. Now, in the spring of the year, the area that we traverse today is covered with a carpet of purple phacelia. The wildflowers here are about as thick as flowers can get. Even a boulder like that has, has a hair uh, piece, a <laughs> toupee added of incredible beauty. And uh, when you get a little closer to them, they only get more lovely with the ferns and the jack in the pulpit. When I was a young naturalist in West Tennessee, I first came into Fiery Gizzard Cove, I'd heard there was a cave, and I had borrowed a state car 
from my boss, who was a railroad man in Nashville, and I had to be back to turn it in at 4.30. And I stopped by on my way back from Chattanooga at Fiery Gizzard Cove, and I thought, maybe I can find that cave. And I drove as far as I could, and that last house was a little lady on the porch. And I said, yes, ma'am, do you know where the cave is? Yeah, it's right up that there little path. Um, and she saw my uniform on and my badge. It said naturalist. She used naturalist. Yes, ma'am. Has you ever had any engine turn them? Well, no, ma'am. What's that? She says, the ours one. I said, well, all right. And I could see I was going to be late for getting back to my railroad <laughs> man boss. And so I thought I better speed this up. I said, what do they eat? She says, most generally they eat the root. So I got down there with my pocket knife and I got the root up and I chomp, chomp. Oh! If any of you have ever had any engine turn them, you know what a mistake I made because that has about 10,000 times concentration of oxalic acid and needles, like pins and needles, went all the way down wherever there was wetness. And I ran for the creek and tried to drink and dilute it and it made it worse. And for about five minutes I was speechless. I was so in pain. I would have killed her if I could have, but I wasn't able. And in the meantime, she was doubled over laughing at me. <laughs> She had caught that boy, that flat ladder. She had fixed his goose. And so then she set the hook. And I said, lady, you like to pison me when I finally could talk again. She said, well, if you hadn't been in such a hurry, I'd have told you that Biles at first. <laughs> so that was my introduction to, to this kind of people up here. I'm telling you, you know, so watch these little ladies. They know more about these herbs than enough to get you. Uh, well, we've got the long spurred violets we've got, we saw. Uh, the uh, variations on violet themes down there today, you wouldn't believe we have the recurvatum of the Trillium tribe. And uh, we find, I grew up with this on the Mississippi River in West Tennessee, but it's not common in between. It's uh, up here. That makes you all the more wonderful. Mm -hmm. And here's uh, Mary Elizabeth and Herman Bagenstoss discovering a patch of pink lady slipper. And more than anyone else, they're the mountain people that would never shut up. And they kept on, like these folks tonight, talking about the beauty of these mountains until everybody else said, well, we'll borscht. And they got busy, and they helped to save it. And so uh, Herman used to lead a lot of wilderness trips from the DuBois Conference Center of the Episcopal Church. And uh, uh, they are, they're the famous uh, bakery people from Tracy City. Now, as you travel down into Laurel Creek, you'll find a wonderful write-up in J.B. Killebrew's Agricultural Resources of Tennessee. He talks about the wonderful waterfalls. It was mostly written by his secretary, Olga, whose husband was the Swiss consul, and she was comparing this area to Switzerland. But she talks about the Magnolia Trapetula, and she talks about the, the roaring waterfalls as it goes down Laurel Creek and the wonderful azalea or wild honeysuckle, as they call it up here, which you, I hope, saw the, the bushes of, but not the blossoms, because it's an earlier blossom at Greeter Falls today. That's where I shot these pictures, right at Long's Mill Pool. And then the wonderful trailing arbutus, which is not as common here as it is further north, but it's still found. And trailing arbutus has such a wonderful perfume, you can smell it under the snow in the first of the year, around February, sometimes it'll pop up. And there was a poet here. Uh, he's the guy in the white shirt named Leonard Tate. And he was born in a little cabin out near Beersheba, just, on the other, just around the little perimeter road that goes around. And his, his sister was a great musician who went to New Orleans and performed for 50 or 60 years. But Leonard Tate wrote wonderful poems. He wrote Mountain People. He wrote a poem about Arbutus. He said, how often from the waking land I brought Arbutus to my mother's sick and trembling hand. How strange and sweet this wonderful perfume might now accentuate the presence of her absence in my room. With him was also a Dr. Bigby from the Savage Gulf Preservation League and one of our great uh, park managers, uh, Jim Robb, who uh, set a real standard for us. Now, Dr. Bigby is peeping around the con here from a safe distance at Poison Sumac. And some of us were out there today with Todd and uh, were busy doing what I was doing, which was taking pictures of the, of the blossoms and forgetting about it. And then finally, um, Bigby said, Mac, do you get poison ivy? Well, yes, sir. Well, you're standing at Poison Sumac. Woo! I ran for the pond, which was Plantation Pond, which is over on the North Rim. And when I asked Bud Werner about that, this pond was so valuable, it was given to the Nature Conservancy by the Bowaters Lumber Company. And Bud says, Mac, I couldn't even find the pond when I was out there the other day. It's done silted in and the pine trees are there and it's all changed. And I'm afraid he's right. But uh, I can tell you even the, the 
regular sumac was well protected around here by some of its defenders, like this wolf spider. And so we're lucky to have uh, some of the... Uh, huh? Tom Patrick, yeah, indeed. A young Tom Patrick. A younger Tom Patrick, that's right. Some of these pictures I made long ago. But uh, he's looking at uh, the wonderful bog, and we saw another one today out from Altamont. But this one has that great uh, long spurred orchid, that Plantathra and Tegulovia, and the cinnamon fern, and phlox, and uh, uh, orchid uh, ciliaris, and flava, and many others. This was a wonderful place. And uh, this is what the one I'm telling you that's uh, likely to be filled in because um, here's the Virginia chain fern out there. There's also another bog at, out on Peak Mountain that some of you may have discovered where it's very thick. And uh, around in little seeps around in the Gulf, you find uh, the uh, Osmondia. And uh, John Muir saw a lot of this, but here's both the Royalis and the Sunman uh, in this little wet seep. And uh, these seeps can be very ancient and they, they're very valuable. Maidenhair fern as well, uh, with the maiden enjoying it. And Dr. Robert Crawl from Vanderbilt found Veratrum woodii on one of our trips. He went back two more times looking for it, but couldn't find it again. I suspect he got the last one for his, <laughs> for his voucher. But uh, anyway, that's how uh, I understand. Somebody else has Veratrum woodii uh, in the room, I, I think I asked today. But it's not a common thing, and uh, it's not somebody you'd recognize on a street corner, is it? But uh, this is what we have to watch for. Now here's the Cordell bog. The Cordell bog that came by today it used to be a wonderful uh, orchid uh, treasury, four species there, maybe five. And uh, today it's almost completely covered over with trees and it's uh, filled in. Unfortunately, the, the uh, lumber companies, our bottom line is to make money and they, they cut everything out that they could get a stick out of. They flushed it through the paper mill. Now they send everything through the shipping mills and they don't leave even a huckleberry. And this, was, this is between Savage Gulf and Collins River. They cut it down to the mineral soil and the mud came off of it so bad that for the first time the caves underneath Savage Gulf plugged up and the Savage Nursery on the lower end couldn't get out of their property after 200 years. That was the first time they knew it, they were flooded. So this is what's happening up here. The other thing now is the TVA is reopening uh, the Bush administration is pushing for more coal mines, and the Southern Energy Corporation seems to have the strongest lobbyists in the White House. They want to sell high sulfur coal, and they want to dig it right here. If they have to take the whole mountaintop off to get it, they're glad to do it, and they can somehow make a profit. This is Piney Creek, which becomes Piney Falls and Fall Creek Falls State Park, a 19,000-acre park, which was within a mile of the huge 300-foot-long coal shovels over here at Skyline Coal. If you want to see them, you go out the back way to Logger Cable Road today, where we were, and go up Highway 111. And they've shut them down because the last administration said this is unsuitable for mining. But we better watch because it could change in a heartbeat. Already we see signs up that say Savage Gulf Estates. And who wouldn't want to have a second home up here? And we are going to see more in the future if we're not careful uh, where we used to go, where wonderful bogs used to be. So the little bog that we saw out here uh, under the gas pipeline, I bet if we took a hat and passed it around tonight, we could take up enough money to buy that little bog and the surface rights of that and keep it protected. And you need to stop uh, thinking about the fact that you're going to come back next year and it's going to be there, because next year you may be too late. It may be a hog farm and this is what we, or a chicken house. This body of falls, everything but what I'm showing you in this picture is now a subdivision. And the same thing's about to happen to Bridalvale Falls. It's on the market. Coolidge Rift is on the market. And here today and subdivided tomorrow. Breeder Falls, where some of you went today, uh, is uh, already sold most of the lots on the south end. Azalea Cumberland Densis, discovered in Cumberland County for the first time by Paul Adams, who helped uh, survey the Smoky Mountain Park. Uh, this bush was just bulldozed. Uh, by the developer. They, they didn't know it was there. They didn't know what it was. And this is what happened. Now, this is a shame because the nursery industry here in this neighborhood is, the, is one of the greatest in the world. And many of these things they're destroying are some of the most valuable species they could be perpet perpetuating and uh, cultivating for the nursery trade. We need to get that across to them. The best way of, of conservation is propagation because they can make a profit at it. And so the, the uh, Savage Gulf League at one night over here 
passed the hat and took up enough to make a one lot, to buy one lot for a parking lot. And some of you are up here on the mountain on October the 2nd. We're going to be meeting over uh, in the dining hall, and we're going to have another program like this on Saving Savage Gulf, and we invite you to come. That's at 6 o'clock here on October the 2nd. And it's an open meeting for anyone to come. So if you love Greater Falls, if you love the mountain waters, if you love to hear mountain music from the mountains, if you want to have a place where this can continue, we have been able to hire um, some of the local mountain boys, and they have planted hemlock trees. And this is Jim Bailey, who I took in Savage Gulf, and uh, Charles Fleury, um, and they, um, they love this area. This is the Grundy County Wilderness Society. The Savage, uh, the, and it's their family that sold us the Savage. It was his, uh, some of his folks. So they, they care, and uh, they're trying to help us restore the Fiery Gizzard Trail down to Foster Falls, which has been so popular, it's almost worn out, and we're having to rebuild parts of it and restore it. And so what we're trying to do here is to put together uh, a, an increased amount of land that we can protect and defend. Uh, we are north of here, up at uh, Altamont and Bersheba, but as you come down toward uh, Tracy City, we have the Grundy Lakes, the Grundy Forest. The first 200 acres was, was taken up with a collection by the CCC boys so they could have a camp there. A wonderful trail was laid out 50, 60 years later. It's very lovely, but the rest of it, it all goes across private property. This belongs to the Werners. The Werners and the Stanleys have just agreed that they might be willing to sell it but uh, we've got to raise the money. We would like to go all the way around to Foster Falls, and we'd like to keep this area in its gorgeous condition. Look at the land ownerships out here at Savage Gulf. Uh, some of you today were out here at Greater Falls, but just out here is 10 acres, which a lawyer has purchased right next to War Tree Falls. There's three more lots just been sold. There's going to be a bed and breakfast down here. Um, there are people who we know and love that have houses built now right up here looking across uh, into Savage Gulf from the edge. Um, over here was a Champion International track which they wouldn't sell to us because we were opposing the Pigeon River uh, and we wanted it to be cleaned up so the Champion Company wouldn't sell it to the state. We sold it to Bullwaters and clear cut it. All of this big wedge out here has been butchered again and all that mud still going into Savage. We're trying to buy a little piece off of Charlie Page down here, but uh, all of this is at tremendous risk. So we have a large chunk of land, but it's just like a big crow foot. We can't and haven't yet been able to put all of the defensible boundaries in place. Therefore, we were able to get Marvin Runyon, former director of TVA, former U.S. Postmaster, former uh, uh, General Motors executive. Marvin Runyon agreed to be our honorary co-chair of the Saving Great Spaces campaign, and I'm the other co-chair. And he's talking to Bud Warner here, who's willing to let us have his 8,500 acres, and it's now or never. We've got to come up with the money. And so saving great spaces for 30 years has been the purpose of our friends group. We invite you to join us. And uh, we were able to raise the money to, to build a habitat for humanity and build a ranger house down here at Grundy Forest. Uh, we were able to uh, clean up uh, some of the junkyard bluff. So oh, thank you. If I might wind up, I would say with a little help from our friends, as they uh, indicated here, we can uh, do a great deal. Our friends group, uh, we have friends group with a number of our parks, but the one that's been the most effective has been right here, already 55 acres down around Anderson Falls, was gotten with the help of the rock climbers. Uh, we hope that this treasury of trees is not going to be threatened by fire or by other aspects. We hope that places like Bortree Falls, which has a cabin site within 100 yards now about to be built, can instead be obtained so that we can protect this area and its beautiful hemlock growth from the hemlock adelgis and whatever else may come along. Our children of tomorrow are really counting on us, and so are the plants. One of my friends photographed this fungus in fiery gizzard and I'll be darned if I know what the heck it is. It could be a penicillin that could stop AIDS, but I, it, there's got to be a lot of unanswered things up here to questions we're not smart enough yet to ask, and that's what makes this such a wonderful thing. Thank you all for coming, and come back often.